Front Desk, Chapter 54 At school that day, we had a substitute. Miss Morgan had big, thick glasses, whereas Mrs. Douglas was chatty and loud. Miss Morgan was soft-spoken and cautious. It's only my second time teaching, she explained to us. Some of the other kids, when they heard this, immediately started chatting, talking right over Miss Morgan, even when she clapped her hands two short times and then three long times with our class which was our class sign to pay attention. Really, guys, I must insist you pay attention, Ms. Morgan said quietly, which prompted Jason to cup his ear and ask, What did you say? The other kids thought this was really funny and burst out laughing. Jason was delighted. For the next half an hour, whenever Ms. Morgan said anything, Jason would bird out, Huh? What did you say? I kicked Jason repeatedly under my seat to knock it off, but he ignored me. At lun by lunchtime, Ms. Morgan had lost all control of the class. Now kids were openly raising their hand and saying, Ms. Mousy, I mean, Ms. Morgan, I have a question. Then covering their mouths as they disintegrated into nonstop giggling. As we filed out one by one for lunch, Ms. Morgan crumbled into her chair. I went back to the classroom during lunch to grab a copy of my story for the essay contest so that I could show Lupe. As I was about to walk in, though, I heard sniffling. Miss Morgan was on the phone. I snuck a peek. Her glasses were on her desk, and she was rubbing her eyes. I'm just not cut out for this, she said on the phone. You don't know what it's like, Wilma. The kids hate me. I immediately froze. I backed up against the wall next to the open door. I dared not move, afraid that Ms. Morgan might hear me and know that I'd heard. She'd be so embarrassed. Maybe I just don't have what it takes to be a real teacher, she said, weeping into the phone. The lunch bell rang, and Ms. Morgan quickly got off the phone. I waited until some other students filed in first before slipping in, too. As soon as class resumed, Jason started doing the thing with his ear again. Huh? I really can't hear you. This isn't a church, he shrieked. The other kids laughed again. Jason looked around the room, very pleased with himself. And you don't look like a nun, he added. Another monstrous wave of laughs. Ms. Morgan looked like she was about to cry. Can I talk to you? I asked Jason. Jason looked at me like I just asked him if he wanted to do the foxtrot. Uh, no, Jason said. I raised my hand. Miss Morgan, I just remember Jason and I need to go to the gym and tell Mr. Hankin, the PE teacher, which kids are absent today. I lied. Can't you just call him? Miss Morgan asked, picking up the phone. No, I said. He, uh, you know, he's out on the field. No, he's not, Jason protested. But I kicked him hard under the seat and he shut up. Miss Morgan nodded and said we could go. When we got outside, I turned to Jason. What are you doing? I asked him. What do you mean? Why are you giving Ms. Morgan a hard time? I said. You mean Ms. Mousy? He laughed. It's not funny, I said. Seems pretty funny to everyone else. Well, I'm not everyone else, I said, and neither's Ms. Morgan. Do you know I overheard her talking to her friend on the phone, and she said she didn't know if she had what it takes to be a real teacher, and she was crying. So? Jason snapped in the tone that reminded me so much of his father. I wanted to throw my hands up and walk away. But I didn't walk away. Instead, I said very softly, You don't have to do this. Do what? he asked. I looked into his eyes. You don't have to be your father, I said. Jason didn't say anything back. He just turned and walked back to the classroom. He didn't say a word to me the rest of the day, but he didn't make fun of Ms. Morgan again. I didn't expect to see Jason again after school, but later that day he showed up at the motel. Mr. Yao's car roared into the motel around sunset with Jason in the passenger seat. I immediately tossed the baseball cap onto the front desk. Then I froze. Two Chinese immigrants had come about an hour ago. I had put them in room six. They're here. Chinese visitors were here, and so was Mr. Yao. Frantically, I ran out the back door as Mr. Yao and Jason were getting out of their car. Mom! Dad! I ra yelled, racing up the stairs. Mom! Dad! What? Mr. Yao asked. 
At the sound of Mr. Yao's voice, my parents rushed out of the room. My mom glanced at me and over at room six. Uh, uh, we weren't expecting you, Mr. Yao, she said. Mr. Yao didn't even look up at my mom. He turned his attention instead to the instead to the rooms, which now that it was getting dark outside, were starting to light up one by one. You know, I've been hearing this disgusting little rumor about a motel that's been hiding Chinese immigrants in the rooms, he said. My dad laughed nervously. Where, where did you hear that, he asked. That's crazy. That's what I said. Not only is it crazy, but stupid. Whoever is stupid enough to do a thing like that is bound to get caught. And when they do, they will never work in this country again. Never. The entire time he talked, he didn't take his eyes off the rooms. When all the rooms were lit up, he reached into his pocket, pulled out a pen and piece of paper, and started jotting down room numbers. And that's when I knew we were doomed. Room 6 didn't have a registration card. Come down, Mr. Yao said to my parents. Let's, make, let, let's take a little walk over to the front desk together, shall we? My parents descended the stairs. The sweat stains on my father's shirt stretched and spread. I lingered behind. If I could just warn the immigrants in room six, maybe they could slip out or hide. Mia, Mr. Yell, Yao yelled. I jumped. It was the first time Mr. Yao ever called me by my name. Yes, I asked. Stay where I can see you, he hissed. We're all going to the front desk together, and if the numbers on my list don't match the registration cards, there will be hell to pay. In the front office, Mr. Yao picked up the stack of registration cards and started flinging them onto the table one by one as he cross-referenced them with his list. When at last he came to room six and saw there was no registration cards, he pounded the table with his hand. Are you hiding immigrants in my motel? He screamed at my dad. Is that what you're doing? Look at me when I'm talking to you. My dad lifted his eyes inch by inch. No, sir, my dad denied. Don't lie to me. I was born, I was born at night, but not last night. Mr. Yao was standing so close to him, his angry words fell like spittle on my dad. I'm going to give you one last chance to tell me just who the hell is in room six, he said in a low voice. I don't know, sir, my dad said. You don't know, Mr. Yao asked. Are you saying some people just snuck in and started sleeping there? Because if that's the case, I will call the cops right now. His threat cut into us like glass. My mom and I looked at each other. Mr. Yao was making my dad choose between his job and his friends, and we both knew which my dad would choose. There was no way my dad would throw the people in room six under the bus, not in a million years. As he opened his mouth to confess, I jumped in. You must have gotten the number wrong. There's no one in there, I said. We'll just see about that, Mr. Yao growled. As he lifted the front desk divider to go outside, a car pulled into mot the motel. Mr. Yao stopped for a minute to see who it was. The girl with the jeans stepped out of the car. She'd come back with her mom. My blood curdled when I saw her. I looked down at my jeans, her jeans, as the girl and her mom stepped into the front office. Mother, look, she pointed at my jeans. Those are mine. You stole my jeans. All around me, eyes narrowed, her eyes, Mr. Yao's eyes, her mother's eyes. I looked down at my jeans and up at her. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say, so I lied. Those are mine. I, these are mine, I said. Mr. Yao's mouth curled into a tight smile as he put his stack of registration cards down and turned his full attention to the girl. Sweat dripped down my spine, even as the front office air conditioner blasted on me. Is it true? Did you, did you steal this girl's pants? Mr. Yao asked, not even looking at me. I squirmed in the jeans, the hard fabric digging into my flesh. No, I... I struggled to speak. My throat felt like sand. I didn't. I don't steal, I swear. Liar, the girl said. Jason looked away. 
I followed his gaze out the window to my parents, who had tiptoed out of the back and were now standing in front of room six. I quickly looked over at Mr. Yao, but he was too busy gawking at me, like I was a criminal, to notice where my parents had gone. Of course you stole them, Mr. Yao said. You're a thief. That's probably what you were doing at Macy's, too, when my wife saw you. It was not... I glared at him. I resented the way he looked at me, like he knew me so well, when in fact he knew nothing about me. I don't steal, I repeated. You're saying these are your jeans? Yes, I insisted, with as much conviction as I could muster. The girl pointed at the jeans. Show us the label then, she said. She turned to Mr. Yao and added, My name's written in permanent marker on the label. Ugh! I knew I should have cut off the label. Do it or I'll do it, Mr. Yao commanded. He took a step toward me. Before he could dig his gross fingers into my jeans, I reached behind and squeezed my eyes shut and pulled out the label. There, in all bold, shouty caps, was the name Polly, written in permanent marker. Take them off, Mr. Yao barked at me. Now. Polly smirked. She was clearly enjoying this. Mr. Yao pointed to the manager's quarters. Go, he said. I limped into my room and quietly closed the door. The jeans felt hot to my touch. I peeled them off like bark, stomping on them on the cold floor in my socks. Tears pooled at the base of my eyes, and I stared at the jeans. Hours ago, my friend, my pride, and now my shame. I got out my ugly floral pants and put them back on. Fear pressed me forward, the fear that if I didn't emerge from my room, they'd come barging in. Here, I said, handing the jeans back to the girl. I didn't apologize, nor did I cry. I refused to give Mr. Yao the satisfaction. Chapter 55 I thought the whole point of having customers fill in their address was so you could mail them their stuff back in case you left it behind, Mr. Yao said after the girl and her mom left. Wasn't that your idea? I couldn't speak. The humiliation had burned a hole in my tongue. I vowed never to talk to him again. My parents slipped back in through the back door and joined us. Where'd you guys go, Mr. Yao asked. You guys missed the whole thing. In all his excitement over the jeans, he had completely forgotten about the immigrant in room six. I looked up at my mom and could tell from her face that they were safe. My mom would never know the price I paid for their safety. Jason knew. The whole time his dad was interrogating me, he had been looking out the window. He saw my parents knock on room six's door. He saw them sneak the immigrants out of their rooms and out the back. He saw the whole thing. But he never said anything. Dear Jason, Thank you for not saying anything to your dad. I don't know why, but you didn't. Maybe you're not so bad after all. Your classmate, Mia. I stared at the last part. Maybe you're not so bad after all. My grandmother used to say that people don't change. Our heart is like a rubber band. It might stretch a little, but eventually it snaps right back. I'm not sure if I believe that. Part of me did. We were talking about Jason here, the same kid who took my pencil and licked it. The other part of me, though, wondered. There used to be a time when I let my cousins walk all over me. They were all boys, and I was the only girl, and in China, girls are kind of like spare tires. It's nice if you have one, but they're not important. Even my grandmother, whom I loved and missed so much, believed this. She believed it like she believed the sky was blue, like it was a fact. Girls were not as useful as boys. She never came out and said this, of course, but she'd have little ways of showing it, like always putting the best dishes in front of my cousins at family dinners and not me. She'd pat their heads and tell them to eat up before the dish got cold, and I'd watch as they snatched and grabbed the food with their greedy chopsticks until there were hardly any more pieces of chicken left for me, only burnt onions. One day I picked up my chopsticks and started grabbing back. I snagged chicken, shrimp, whatever I could pick up with my chopsticks, and hoarded it all in my mouth. Hey, Shen complained, not fair. We weren't close then, and I narrowed my eyes at him. 
As I picked up my chopsticks, I reached for more food. Shen blocked my chopsticks with his. Our chopsticks collided like swords. The two of us held them in position, neither willing to back down. It went on like this the next night and the night after that. Eventually, our chopsticks war got so bad, my grandmother had to use her own chopsticks to draw a line in the food and declare one side mine and the other side Shen's. From then on, every dish had a line. I remember countless birthdays, Chinese New Year, everything had a line. Then one day I looked down and the line was gone. My grandmother had forgotten to draw it. I waited for Shen to take the first piece of chicken and he waited for me. Neither of us grabbed, neither of us hoarded. Somehow we'd gone from food enemies to friends. Neither of us knew when it had happened. We just knew we no longer needed the line. I thought about what and how maybe people, I thought about that and how maybe people do change as I thought about Jason. I didn't end up giving the letter to Jason. I was going to, but for some reason, I just didn't. You don't, you know how sometimes you raise your hand, but when the teacher finally calls on you, you pretend you were only tucking your hair. It was kind of like that. As the first of the spring flowers bloomed, I tried to forget the painful memory of the jeans. It helped that I had Hank and Lupe to distract me, and the mailman. Every time he came, I thought about the contest. I thought, this is it. Today's the day. My life's going to change. But the letter from Vermont did not arrive. Other unexpected news did arrive, though, which completely shook up our world. Mr. Yao was selling the motel. My parents' faces turned white. The temperature in the room plummeted as Mr. Yao told them the news. A real estate deal for him in Nevada had gone bad, and he needed a cash injection. So what does that mean for us? My parents asked him. You, Mr. Yao asked. He snorted like we, we hadn't, like we hadn't occurred to him at all. Then he shrugged. Depends on what the new owner wants to do with you. He said it like we were inventory, freely disposable along with the washer and dryer. Lupe told me not to worry. Motels weren't like houses. They took ages to sell. That's, there's a whole inspection process and everything, she said. I'm sure you guys are going to be out of here before Mr. Yao even finds a buyer. Have you told your parents about the essay contest yet? No, I said. I didn't know what it was about me and secrets. Once I had one, I just couldn't let it go. I would feed it and snuggle it, and it would grow and grow inside me until it took on a life all its own. So no, I hadn't told my parents. I'd been too busy imagining the look of surprise on their face to actually surprise them. They're going to freak when you win, Lupe said with a smile. My parents didn't freak, did freak, but not over my winning the contest. They were freaking out over who the new motel owner was going to be. Oh God, what if he hates Chinese people, my mom asked, biting down on her nail. Or if he wants to run it himself, my father said. Should we look for another job, my mom asked. What should we do? My parents paced the living room, fretting and panicking, while I sat quietly in the corner. That was the problem with keeping a secret. You are all alone on your own little island. Have you ever thought about how nice it would be if we owned the motel, I asked. I just kind of threw it out there. My dad laughed. That would be nice, he said. He looked into the distance and let himself imagine for a second. We wouldn't have to work every single day. We can take Sundays off totally as together as a family. We could all go swimming, my mom added. I'd love to jump in that pool. Me too, I said. I'd love to get some sleep, my dad said. If we owned the motel, I could put up a sign that says, Sorry, I'm sleeping. Come back in the morning. A smile played at his lips as he pictured how extraordinary life would be if he could sleep through the night. Then his smile faded and reality set in. Maybe in another life, he said, picking up his broom. I shook my head. No, dad, not in another life, I said. In this life. Our eyes locked. A second passed, and then another. And then I whispered my secret.